Hello and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. It is Saturday, Saturday, February 4th, 2012. I can't believe we're moving so quickly. Our topic today is using Evernote and our special guest today is William Stites. Good morning. Pleasure to have you here. Um, I want to start out right away for the people who haven't been in our show, just as a reminder um, that we do. Um, have a website, live.classroom20.com. If you came in on Twitter, take a look at our website because we have a special section there for recordings. And so everything that happens today, we post on that page. We'll post the full Blackboard Collaborate link. We'll post an audio file, an MP4 file. We'll be um, posting uh, all the links in a blog post. So everything that happens today, it's there. So if the chat went by, you missed it. Please don't worry about it because we're going to be posting the chat as well. Uh, and as we get started, I just want to again send out a, a chat to uh, a thank you to Tammy Moore who is in the chat providing closed captioning. So if it's something you need, uh, English is not your first language or having a hearing impairment, Tammy is very faithfully typing for us uh, every Saturday uh, morning to help everyone help help everyone participate. So. Yeah, I'm going to put you to work. Many of you have already told us where you are located in the world, but let's catch up everyone together. This is where you're going to get that laser pointer on the left of the whiteboard. And you're going to take it and drag it over to where you're located. That's me warming around. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario. Peggy's in Phoenix, Arizona. And Kim is in San Antonio, Texas. And our guest, Bill Sykes, is in New Jersey. So if you haven't been able to do figuring out the map and the laser pointer, just type where you are in the chat. Okay. We talked about uh, keeping a record of everything, all the chats and the links that we're using today. So we have actually got something called Live Binder. And can I get one of my good girls to put that in web tour for me just so I can demonstrate? And you should all be seeing a page load up called Classroom 20 Live February 2012 with a whole bunch of links. That first page is going to take a bit of time before it's not showing for me yet, but it's uh, Bill's uh, website. So if I was to click on any of these links, and you can't do this right now, um, but if I went over here, and you should be following me, I think, to uh, a page about Evernote. So everything we've got, there's how it works. This live binder is particularly uh, effective tool for um, curating all the links and finding the one spot for quick, good reference. And we do pick up links in the chat, and so it adds them to the to the live binder as well. So that, thank you very much, girls. And I'm just going to go back to the slides. Is um, the intro part, and I think I'm going to put you to work with some questions. So now the polling part, the icon on the right. Um, there's an A to get the slide moving for you. A to F. Um, what is your role in education? Can you throw that up? A, B, C, D, E, F. And if you don't want to get any of those categories, as it says, other, type it in the chat. Maybe you're you're both. I think a lot of you are parents, but uh, not everybody's a parent teacher. So have fun trying to figure out A to F. In in a minute, I'm going to. Show you what the results of that particular poll question. Drag it over here on the screen. If it will let me do that. No, it won't let me move that. So that particular uh, poll question looks like many of us are teachers. Thank you very much for moving it. And a few of you haven't figured out or are patiently waiting till we get through the poll questions. But Bill, it gives you a good idea that you have a lot of teachers, instructors, professors in the group with us today. Okay, so we're going to change the polling options and clear the votes. And I've just about got that worked out. And we'll go to our next poll question, which is, do you use Evernote either personally or professionally in your life? So yes, if you do, no, if you don't, and that icon is just to the right of all those, you know, smiley face over the right. Nope, people are getting this one great. 
the votes are coming in nicely. Okay, I'm going to publish results again. And someone's going to be kind enough to move that off the content. It's going to show us that over, notice about 50% of people in the session are using Evernote. Things aren't cooperating on my computer as I would like them today, but we're going to keep going. Poll question number three, do you use Evernote with your students? So that's assuming that you have a classroom, you have students, uh, K-12 to or post-secondary. Green, check, yes, red X, no. Show the results. So, big difference here. Bill, take note that not as many people are using Evernote with their students. I think we have had enough uh, fun together with the uh, poll questions and the map. It's my now my opportunity to. Again, uh, the topic today is using Evernote, and our special guest is Bill Stites. And I just want to give a quick introduction to Bill. He's the Director of Technology at Montclair Kimberly Academy in Montclair, New Jersey. He's the blogger in chief for Ed Social Media, as well as being an advisor for the New Jersey Education Computer Cooperative. And he started his co career as a classroom uh, teacher in grade three. And with a bit of knowledge, he took on computers and networking, Licking things in the beginning on college, uh, and then moving on to being uh, now the technology direction. So, Bill, thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Uh, I think our, our first task for you is we're just going to give you the newbie question, and uh, the microphone will be yours. And thank you very much for being with us today. So, what is Evernote? Okay, uh, Evernote, uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it or haven't used it, Evernote is a um, no, primarily a note-taking application. Uh, it is one where uh, if you listen to the people talking uh, from Evernote, they, uh, it is a place to basically empty your brain and keep everything so that you can uh, have all of your stuff in one place uh, where you can search it, uh, find it, uh, make it very easily accessible to you. But it is that and a, um, that and a whole lot more. Um, when you see how you can use it actually in, in the classroom with students, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Evernote in education is something that, based on the poll question, looks like a lot of people are using Evernote, but not necessarily using it uh, with their students. And really what I hope to do over uh, the next uh, few, few minutes uh, is to hopefully give you an overview of how well you can use it with your students. Um, what are some of the, the pros and cons and some of the hurdles, um, and really why uh, it is uh, a, such a good tool to use. Um, I can tell you before we get started that Evernote was the fastest uh, adopted tech tool uh, we had at Montclair Kimberly ever um, in terms of its adoption and use uh, throughout the school. So. Um, it's one that we are uh, very heavily invested in, uh, both as a school, but as a part of our, uh, of our teaching and learning. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, really give you a, uh, a quick look. We had Evernote, we were the first school in the nation um, to adopt Evernote, uh, Evernote Premium, and I'll explain uh, what Premium is in, in, in a little while. Um, for our students in grades 4 through 12. Um, a little bit of history about MKA and, and why we chose this tool and how we were able to do this. We have a student one-to-one -one program in grades 4 through 12 that we launched at the beginning of last year um, where we gave every student uh, and faculty member a MacBook Pro computer. And one of the things that we did is we loaded up all of those computers with a, a suite of software. So they've got software tools from Microsoft, from Apple, from Adobe, 
um, and a number of other things uh, from inspiration, comic life, so on and so forth. But we added Evernote uh, into that mix um, after using it in some of our professional development um, opportunities over the summer where we were talking with teachers on ways to help organize students to collaborate, to share, uh, and to work together. And what I want to do is uh, show you a quick uh, video that Evernote actually came to our school, recorded, and um, I just want to share with you very quickly. So uh, just bear with me while I pull this up. Students think in a 21st century environment. Kids aren't sitting down with books and tabbing pages and taking traditional note cards the way they used to. They're looking at videos. They are pulling from research databases. They're pulling from internet websites. Our one-to-one -one program, we've given every student a MacBook computer. We use Evernote as the main tool in my social studies class. One, you can use it for just taking notes in class. And I use it for a really big group collaborated project. Well, I like that I can bring Word documents and PowerPoints and such into it. If I can have everything in one place, where it's indexed and I can search for it, it would be so much more organized and would really help me as a student. To teach students Evernote, it's just like watching a kid get on a bike. The light bulb just went off. And I tried to kind of teach my friends about it, and they liked it too when they used it. Because they didn't get that with the paper, but they all of a sudden got it when they saw it in a notebook form on a computer. I just draw it, and then I take a picture, and we have a shared notebook, and so all the kids can just access that day's class notes right then and there without having to do any work. When we showed them that feature, there was an audible gasp in the room. So I knew by then it had kind of caught on. I use it in every class now. I'm using it in English, social studies, science, Spanish, performance ensemble. I actually use it for tech leadership, too. Basically everything I can. It's not a new Bill, if you're talking, you need to put the mic back on. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you taught me to turn it off when I'm playing the video, and as I, as I thought, I'd forget to turn it back on when I was ready to speak. Um, that is, uh, again, what it would look like if you were to come into our school and uh, walk around and uh, talk to some of the students and ask them about what they're doing with Evernote. Um, one thing to, to mention with that is, um, you're, you're hearing from teachers and students. That video was filmed, I believe, in late October, early November of last year, which was only three months into our one-to-one -one program. Um, so it was, um, it was very, um, very quick uh, adoption and, and, and uh, picking up. There are a number of other videos. There's two other videos, actually. One um, is a little bit longer. Um, a little bit longer interview with me uh, on it um, that you can find uh, on my website or on uh, YouTube. The other is a basically an hour-long session that we did in New York City um, where we were, uh, three of us, myself, uh, Jenny Zagarello, who at the time was our uh, Director of Educational Technology, and Christian Ely sat on stage with uh, Andrew Sinkov, um, and we're really talking about Evernote in, in the entire school, what that was like, much of what you'll hear today, but a, a Q&A session there as well. So if you've got um, any, um, any additional questions or, or, or you want to hear a little bit more, you can look at those uh, resources that are both online. But for those of you that really aren't familiar with Evernote or aren't really used to using it, um, Evernote is your filing cabinet for everything that you could possibly want to keep track of. Um, it is a great tool for simply taking notes and uh, working on different things. Uh, you can record audio notes. You can attach files, pictures, PDFs. Um, you can put in a, a, a large array of not only uh, written notes, but of things that you've collected um, in, in different ways. Um, it allows you to organize all of those things in, in folders and in stacks, which are really just uh, larger uh, stacks of folders. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. But it really allows you to keep track of everything that is going on or that you may want to keep track of as part of your 
uh, daily life, whether that is as a student or whether that is as a, as, as a teacher. Um, I mentioned all of the different notebooks and all of the different things that you can put into Evernote. And Evernote is an amazing tool for helping you organize and synthesize uh, information as both a, a as a teacher and as a student. And what you have on, on the screen in front of you is really a look at what the Evernote notebooks look like if you were to have a number of them in your uh, in your Evernote. Um, Evernote application. Um, you can have uh, a multitude of notes organized in stacks. You can see those kind of drop down um, on the on the side there, um, and organize them by uh, by topic, by uh, area that you may be working. Um, just as you would organize a uh, folders on your computer uh, in your documents folder, you can organize all of your notes uh, in in this way. In the center, you see actually a uh, a photograph um, that I took of a uh, a whiteboard in my office. Um, and what is there is I teach a course in Irish studies, and I was trying to diagram out some of the things that we would be working on um, in the course that year. And uh, I think best when working on a whiteboard, I can draw stuff out, cross things out, do do all sorts of different things. But I often like to uh, keep track of what I've put up there. So I simply took a snapshot of that uh, into Evernote um, using the Evernote app on my phone, and I'll touch on that uh, again in a minute. But um, I took a snapshot of that. And what's very nice with Evernote is that Evernote, whether it is a photograph, whether it is a PDF, whether it's any type of document that you have, when you put that into Evernote, um, it becomes searchable. So, for instance, with this uh, image that you have on the screen right here, uh, if I was to type in Strokestown, which may be difficult to read, but it's the top uh, word written on the top uh, right of the, the board there, that would uh, come up. And that was when, in the video when I talked about that there was an audible gasp in the room when we talked to teachers about this, the idea that anything that you put into Evernote is searchable um, is such a huge, huge benefit to um, what you can do and how you can organize or not organize. Um, there's a few. There's been a few articles written about you know using using computers and whether to organize or not to organize. You know, put things in folders, do this, that, and the other thing with them. Um, and it is um, it, Evernote is a very very good tool for doing that because you can search based on the content in the notes. You can search based on the tags that you assign to it. You can search on a a wide um, a wide array of different things um, in there, uh, and 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 pull them up um, when you need them, the moment you need them. Um, just below that um, is a snapshot that I took of my browser. Evernote also has a few plugins that you can use um, to uh, to pull websites in when you are. Um, when you're browsing. Um, so what it will do is it will actually clip all the content from that website and bring it into the Evernote application for you to use. So if I'm doing research again on something for either studies and I come across a website, what I used to do in the past is simply bookmark it. But when I bookmark it in my browser, it's one of the things that I ended up with a, a long scrolling list of bookmarks and I'd have to go in and try to organize all of these different things, so on and so forth. But um, what I would end up doing now is I would simply clip it into Evernote and uh, be able to uh, be able to organize them into the folders based on those topics uh, and have them at the ready when I need it. So I don't bookmark really anything anymore. I simply clip it into Evernote and it makes it that much easier. What's not shown here um, and what I don't have a, a slide for is really this, I, Evernote has another thing called the Evernote trunk. Um, and the trunk is both uh, a, a play on the Evernote symbol of the elephant to remember everything, but also it's like you know you, you open up a trunk and you find all of these things in the trunk that you can use. Um, and Evernote integrates um, very well with a lot of other applications. So you will see a lot of hooks 
from other applications directly into Evernote. So you can send things directly from one application into Evernote. You can pull things out of Evernote and make them available in different applications. One of my colleagues developed an application for the iPad um, that is called Explain Everything. And Explain Everything is a great uh, application for explaining everything that you, you might want to do or recording what is going on um, in the classroom with what you're doing so that you can talk through and, and, and help synthesize information. He built a hook into that application into Evernote so that they can push and pull information between the two. So Evernote also does a really good job of integrating with other things. Um, if you use a LiveScribe pen, um, there's a direct hook and integration into that as well. So there's a lot of things there that you can use. Um, the other thing that is on this slide is just an example of the different types of things that you can put into Evernote. The, the notes from the, the board being the top one, handwritten notes, an image that was things, a clipped web page, a website. You can create to-do lists. One of the other things that you can do, and I mentioned that MKA was the first school to go with a premium account. Premium accounts allow you to do a number of other things as well in that you can uh, put in other types of file formats or other types of documents. So you can add Word documents, you can add GarageBand documents, you can add Keynote or PowerPoint presentations, you can add other types of documents and information um, or file types, I should say, into, um, into the Evernote notes. Um, and hold them there. Um, and there's some really strong benefits to doing that vis-a-vis um, -vis your one-to-one your -one program or just from a, um, a backup standpoint, which I'll touch on in a little bit as well. But the other thing that you get with an Evernote premium account um, is this ability to share, uh, share documents. Um, so what you'll see here is um, the, uh, the this is an example, pardon me, of, of what it looks like for sharing notebooks and what it looks like to have a shared notebook. Uh, the image that is kind of uh, in, the, in the back um, is an example of a Spanish notebook that one of our teachers was using um, with their students where they were, the student was um, taking notes, putting things into their notebook, sharing that notebook with the teacher. Um, the teacher was then able to, from the shared notebook section with an Evernote, go into that student's notebook, see their notes, and then comment on their notes from within uh, within that shared notebook. And they can do that in a variety of ways by simply, you know, writing maybe all in caps, writing in different colors so that they can distinguish between their notes and, and the others. But the other thing is that um, if you note, there's a, there's a small little clipped icon it looks like there. The, uh, the, the student was actually recording their voice and putting up a, a, uh, a, 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 um, a GarageBand file that has their, their reading or their voice in there so that the teacher could then download that and listen to that uh, and evaluate their speaking skills um, and then put something back up and add notes about what they might need to work on or they might need to do better with regards to that. So uh, it, it's provided this, this great ability for teachers to get access to the notebooks without having to collect all of the notebooks. If you think about the writing process, and one of the things that uh, that we often do is we have writer's notebooks where, you know, in an English classroom, you'll have a, a notebook that, you know, students are writing down ideas, different things that they're doing, they're taking notes. If they're in a science classroom and they're working on a, a science project, um, they can have the, the, their, their recording notebook, their, their research notebook. And a lot of times teachers will want to collect those things so that they can read through them and make notes, whether they do it on sticky notes or any of those other type things. Now they don't need to collect those things. They have access to them at any point where they need them. And they don't need to, you know, take it away from the student. The student always has that notebook. They always have the ability to record their observations, to, uh, you know, to put in, you know, that, that, that piece that was interesting, that thing that inspired them to write, that idea. And then now if they clicked it, if they've taken a picture, they can put a picture in there and share it, and the teacher can see it and can do all of these things. So it really, really is great, a great way 
to um, to share information between the student and the teacher from a notebook perspective. But the other thing it allows you to do is it allows you to collaborate on a project. If a teacher shares a notebook that they've got with all of the students in their class, they can all collaborate on a single project together. And one of the things that was really great with this is uh, in the video you saw a teacher sitting on the floor uh, with students all around them. And that was one of our theater teachers at the middle school. And he, in, in theater class, is using Evernote and was using it to collaborate on one of the productions that they were putting on. And the students were able to go and grab ideas and put all of those things into that notebook and share it so that they could all use it together and collaborate on ideas of how to set up a scene and how to, for the people that were working on the sets, they could talk about different things and do all of these different things and really share all of these things uh, with one another so that the next day when they came into the class or after the weekend and they came into class, they were all ready to get started with all of this um, and, and, and go for it. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they didn't miss a beat and were using Evernote to, to do this. So it really provides this opportunity for collaboration, sharing, uh, providing feedback. Um, you talk about, you know, how best to support students and support students and, in their learning. And if you have access to these shared notebooks um, and, and you can see what's going on that students would normally be writing on pen and paper, paper um, would work very, very well, uh, very, very well for that for that purpose. The other thing that that's very nice about Evernote, um, and I saw somebody mentioning something in um, one of the um, one of the chats earlier, is that Evernote is cross-platform. Evernote works just about on any device that you, that you have, um, and I've I've heard some comparisons between Evernote and OneNote. Um, I, I don't use OneNote. Um, I, you know, it, it, it's not something that we, we adopted as a school, but I think that um, I think it's very different than OneNote in that it is available on my uh, my iPhone, my Android, a BlackBerry. I, it's on the desktop of my um, my computer at home. It's on my laptop. Um, I can access it from any browser. I can go into it. Um, I can send. Pardon me. I can send notes. Um, directly from email into Evernote. Evernote gives every user a uh, an email address that is unique to their Evernote account. Um, I can, if I'm tw uh, if I'm on Twitter, if if those of you that may or may not follow me, I have a, I have a strong addiction to Twitter. If I uh, tweet anything to at my en, it will go right into uh, my Evernote notebook. Um, this is something that when we were talking to families about it, um, our upper school um, assistant head of campus, Steve Valentine, used the example of a student who may be on a bus on the way to a game um, and um, wanting to record something or, or had an idea that they wanted to get into their notebook, um, they could take out their phone and uh, put that note in at any point. Um, they could record something, a voice recording. You can take a picture for any, any of these things um, and get it into, into Evernote. Um, one of the, the image, again, that I showed of the blackboard in my, uh, or the whiteboard, I should say, in my office. You know, I take out my phone, I launch my Evernote app, and it's there. Um, and I can take that picture. The one other thing that's very nice with this, I think Evernote, because it is on all of these different platforms, the one thing that isn't mentioned here is that all of this syncs up to the Evernote servers. Um, and uh, to be clear, this is not a cloud-based service. This is not something like, you know, uh, Google Apps where you need to be on, you might need to be online in order to do this. What happens is, is this leverages the best of being um, on on in the cloud and on a device, so that things are kept in sync with one another. Um, so that if you're not online, you still have access to all of your information, to all of your materials. Um, and the next time you have a connection where it can sync up, it'll sync those changes back and forth. Um, between whatever device you're on and the cloud. So where this played out very well for us um, at MKA um, really was in our one-to-one -one program. 
Um, and you can use this, uh, whether it be with a one-to-one -one program, whether it be with a uh, BYOD program, if you're trying to get students, you know, all to be using a, a similar set of, uh, of tools with it. Um, but one thing that we really did with this and why we encourage so many people to use this is one of the things that we wanted to achieve with our one-to-one -one program is to make sure that students uh, had access to um, their their work 24-7, um, 365. Um, our students, again, have uh, each one of them has a MacBook Pro. Um, each one of them has uh, that, that suite of applications. But when that computer is damaged, when there is a problem with that computer, um, and they come in if it's a damaged hard drive, whatever that may be, um, they um, they come into our tech centers and can exchange for a loaner uh, and then log into Evernote and um, download all of their apps. I mean, I'm sorry, not all of their apps. Pardon me, all of their data, all of their information, and get back to get back to work. Um, one thing that um, I, I see kind of scrolling through is this question of privacy with regards to um, Evernote and who who owns those notes. Um, the notebooks and all of the content that is there is owned by the individual. Um, it is something that Evernote takes very seriously with regards to the privacy. Um, they uh, they will not open up a student's notebook to um, to the school um, because again the ownership resides with the with the individual themselves. So th they own it. They can get access to it. They can uh, they they can really again access it from anywhere. And we've really taken advantage of this um, in our school because uh, students come in, cracked screens, you know, damaged hard drives, uh, so on and so forth. And it's probably been one of our biggest tools for recovery. Um, on the on the devices uh, and for our one to one. The other thing Evernote actually does as well is um, this uh, is an image I put together of what Time Machine looks like on a Mac. Evernote does keep track of versioning on um, their notes as well, so that if you make a change to a note and you've got to go back and forth, uh, and you may have you know overwritten something that you want, you can actually go back to an earlier version of it. Um, and, and deal with that. Um, there are, um, you know, a, a number of other ways in which you can use uh, the time machine to restore back so that you can pull things back if you've lost anything. Um, it just works out very, very well for, for those purposes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, and this is um, a, a personal kind of use of Evernote. Um, but one, when I was talking to our parents about it, I used this example as a, as well, um, in that um, you know you can use this really for every part of of your life. Um, I I um, I'm not a a wine aficionado. I know what I like, and I you know I um, I try to keep track of those things when people ask me about wine. Um, again, I, like I said, I, I don't know. I don't know anything. So I just simply take a picture of all of the different bottles that I've liked, and um, I, I can go back and, and search them, and I can put in a little note, you know, about you know a red, a white, you know, um, you know a, a, a Spanish red, an Italian, you know, what, whatever it might be. Um, I can I can use it. This is not something. Um, that I would show as an example in the classroom, uh, but again, when presenting to uh, when presenting to parents and adults, um, I think that this uh, this example can uh, ring true for for a number of different people. Um, there are a, a a few other things I, I want to touch on and um, can really o open up to a lot of questions if you've got them. Um, but uh, the, a few other things, Evernote again. Um, I mentioned that uh, we have a premium um, uh, subscription to Evernote. Evernote does offer educational pricing um, for all of their for, for all the schools uh, at a substantially discounted rate. Um, there is a, a a tool for sponsorship that they have um, where uh, you can send out a link uh, that people can request 
sponsorship, and then the school can uh, take on the the sponsorship of that account. They can turn it on and off whenever they need. So if a student leaves the school mid-year, you can turn it on or off. While you have that premium um, account, um, again, you can put in all of those different file types, all of those different uh, types of media that you can't normally when you have the free version of it. Um, when that does drop off and you no longer have that, you don't lose those notes. All of those things that were done in Evernote during the time in which it was sponsored and at that premium level, though all of those things stay. So it's not as if you lose any of the notes or any of the things that you may have put in there while you had it at the premium level. Um, for There was some question, again, earlier in the chat that I saw for use in younger grades. Um, the one thing to be aware of is that Evernote um, is COPA compliant in as much as they require everyone to be 13 years old uh, to use it. Now, this was an issue for us because we're using this in grades 4 through 12. Um, we have since been working with Evernote, um, and they now, when schools um, – sign up for this, um, there will be a, um, a, 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 an agreement between the school and, the, um, and Evernote that you can have these younger students on, on there, um, but the school needs to obtain verifiable parental consent uh, from parents for the use of this tool or any tool that they have. And on my blog, I've been writing a lot about this, and I have another post coming out very shortly about this. But the COPA law states that schools can act as um, the, the brokers for this parental consent. So if you're using tools online like Turnitin.com, IXL, Pixie, a number of, you know, uh, of, of different um, sites that require username, password, and collect student information for these type of, of, of uses, um, this, uh, this uh, this, I am trying to think of the right term. This kind of uh, way of allowing students to legally use these, these these tools and the schools to be able to use them um, without issue is through parental consent and through these um, these options that at least Evernote is now providing uh, for that. So, um, with that said. Um, I'm really open to uh, to, to questions. Um, I've been talking for quite a while, um, and I'm happy to take uh, to take whatever uh, questions you might have. Great. One of the questions I saw, Bill, was when files are deleted, are they truly deleted from Evernote servers? Well, yeah. When they're deleted, they go into a trash can, uh, and then you have to again simply empty the trash. Evernote is not. Uh, holding on to any of your notes. They're not scanning any of your notes. They're not doing anything with the information that you put in your notes. Um, I know um, a lot of the stuff, I think, when you sign up for a, a Gmail account, they scan your mail and they do different things. That Evernote is not doing any of those things. Great. I didn't think so. And they were talking about is the um, – Recovery on the paid version only. The recovery on the paid version only, meaning that um, no, no. When you have no the uh, the ability to sign in from any machine or to log into any machine and have your notes pulled down to you, um, you can do that from from any type of device. That is something that is just inherent with the way in which Evernote works. Um, and the way in which files are synchronized to their server, and that is free or premium. Um, it, it doesn't matter wh which you have. And another person asked about, is there a way to edit the sizes of photos that are saved in Evernote? Um, I'm not sure whatever you put into Evernote is what goes into Evernote. Um, so uh, you can open, you can open uh, attached documents from within Evernote and uh, save them. Um, so I, I believe you can – Evernote's not going to do anything to reduce the file size on them. You're going to need to do that in another application, but then you can save them back into Evernote at that point. 
Great. Thank you. What, and, one, uh, one thing we did find um, that was interesting that I do want to mention is that uh, a number of our students who were still taking handwritten notes in some of their classes because it made sense for them to do that could take those notes, take them to uh, a number of our copiers around the school, drop them on a copy or PDF them, and then have them emailed to their Evernote notebook so that anything that they were doing in class that they would want to capture, that they would want to have the ability to scan and follow those types of things, they were able to do that through uh, the use of the, the scanners, the, uh, the, the copiers, the PDF, and that email functionality that I mentioned so that they can get all of those things in. And somebody asked about your blog, and your blog is listed in the Live Binder link. And we mm -hmm. will be posting that back several times in the chat. Uh, we'll get to that in just a bit. And are there any other questions that I might have missed? You're welcome to take the mic. If you'd like to do so, just click on the hand, and then we'll give you the ability to uh, activate your mic. Or you can continue posting your questions in the chat. And how do you get web page content into Evernote? And is it a plugin? Um, it is. It is a plugin. Um, it is one that you can install very easily. Um, and what it does is, uh, again, and I'll I'll go back to uh, to one of my earlier slides, um, is that it will put this little elephant icon. Um, if you look on the bottom here, into your uh, your browser's uh, menu bar, um, and you can simply click on that, and it will clip the entire page uh, into um, into the uh, the uh, Evernote notebook for you. You can tag it, you can put it into your notebooks directly from within the browser itself, as well as adding some notes for it as well. And Paul is asking, um, she is fourth grade students, and would she be able to have her students sign up with parent permission, like with just a personal account, teacher account? Um, we have all, all of the students. What was interesting is we created all of the accounts for the students um, because they didn't have the management tools. Um, I, I said that we were the first school to do this, and a lot of the tools that they now have available um, aren't aren't um, weren't there yet. Um, so the the teachers, if they have the um, if they they're signing up for the account with the with Evernote, um, and they have that verifiable parental consent. And again, what we're doing, we're an independent school, um, so we're simply in our enrollment package. We are sending home an additional. A uh, piece of paper that the te uh, the families need to sign and get back. Once you have that, you can very easily go through. There is a checkbox that says that the students are 13, um, but with the information that will be given to you from Evernote when you're creating these accounts, um, you can check through that and um, do it without uh, without uh, violating any of their terms of service. Okay, and so there's no control panel unless you have the teacher or school account. There is not the management interface for it at that point. It would be each individual. If you only, um, when they create the accounts, they're creating them on their own. And once the school then sponsors the, the account, um, that's when the school to some degree takes on the responsibility for doing that. Uh, you know, anyone can go on at any point and create an account. It's really once you sponsor it uh, at that premium level where you get that ability to share and to collaborate and to put all of those different things in there that um, the school becomes involved really in, in, in needing to uh, obtain that, that consent. And when you're saving pictures to Evernote, the picture size has to do with um, either the the application that you're using to Correct. you know trans import or the the um, settings on your camera. Yep, Not exactly. necessarily so Evernote. No, Evernote. If I if I take a picture with my camera and that picture is 
five five megs and I drop that picture into Evernote, that, that picture will go in as a five meg picture. If I grab an image off the web and download it and put that in and it's a, a JPEG or a PNG file or a GIF file, um, that will go in at that size and Evernote will, will hold it as such. There are um, there are some limitations to the amount of space that you do have, and I think there are some limitations to the individual um, size of an attachment for an individual note. Um, but we have not hit that limit or seen that limit, so I'm not 100% sure on what that is. You can't take that a picture with Evernote, but you can save images oh, no, you into can. Evernote. You can. You can. There is the ability. Evernote has the ability to take a oh. a picture note, a vi uh, or a voice note, or even a video note. Um, but if you're putting, it, it'll save that in whatever format it's in. Um, I'm not sure what that is. But if you're adding, if you're adding pictures from other sources, um, it'll hold them to whatever it was that you put them in at. I'm sorry, I wasn't. I wasn't really sure what that question is. But yes, you do have that that ability to take. Written notes, audio notes, video notes, or picture notes. Wow, that's interesting. I wasn't aware of that. That was my mistake. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you transfer ownership of the notebooks? Like, if the student goes from grade to grade. Well, the student. It's either the student owns the notebook or the teacher who is doing it. So, um, the the student. You don't really transfer ownership of a notebook. Um, one person is always going to own that. So if a teacher wants students to share notes with them and in a notebook that they create, they own it, they allow the other people in to share it to make edits and copies. Um, if, a, if a student is sharing a notebook with a teacher, the student always owns that notebook and they'll own all the content that's been added to it even once that, once that, um, that sharing stops. The one thing that I know you can do, by the way, with audio notes, um, and it may be at, uh, for an additional fee, is they can actually – there are services that will actually transcribe the audio notes for you as well. So there's a lot of different things um, that you can do with, with that, again, whether it be through Evernote or through uh, their partnerships with other, um, other applications and other services through the trunk. And somebody asked about copyright issues. That would be up to the teacher to monitor. Yeah, I mean copyright. Uh, you know, again, when you get into using it from education and educational fair use, um, you know, the 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 copyright laws, you know, are really educationally are really in the favor of teachers. Um, and are um, are something that um, you know students and teachers really have a lot of leeway with. Um, I've got a presentation up on SlideShare that I did about Evernote and fair use. Not Evernote and fair use. Pardon me. Um, copyright, fair use, and educational use. Um, that talks a lot about this because of uh, if you're going to use things like. Um, creating uh, EPUBs or uh, iBook Author. Um, it's something that we talk a lot about at our school. And a school would need to have these, the criteria in their AUP to allow it in their school? Would, uh, I just To allow the use of the application in the school? Right. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I mean, uh, in order all, all. I'm sorry. What were you going to say? Go right ahead. Go ahead. No, in order no, for all, Evernote to be used, all, all of the applications that we have um, in school as part of our one-to-one -one program, we've brought in um, for the express purpose of in, enhancing student learning uh, in, in the classroom and the ability to 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 collaborate and to do. A number of different things. So all of these things are clearly outlined, not so much in our AUP, but in you know our our, our standards and guidelines for what we're doing with our one-to-one -one and our educational rationale for our one-to-one -one program. 
Um, so it's it's not it's not those things aren't articulated in the AUP as much as they are in in the uh, those, those rationale statements that we have about why we are doing these different things. And uh, somebody asked about being able to recover uh, notes in the past, um, mm -hmm. like if they had to if they had a problem with their hard drive or something. Yep. Would they be able to recover those notes? Well, again, because Evernote is it, there's there's two there's two answers to that. One, um, if you if your hard drive crashes, um, that's the beauty of Evernote because everything is always synced back up to the cloud. So when you get you know your new computer or you get that hard drive replaced and you log into the Evernote uh, application and you put your account information in, and you hit sync, it pulls all of those things back. So you've never lost anything. Now, if you've deleted a note and deleted it out of Evernote completely, um, you have some other options as far as what you can do. Um, you know, if you haven't deleted it, but you've deleted some things out of a note, the versioning would take over there. Um, the other thing you can always do is contact Evernote support, um, and they may be able to go back onto their servers and pull a note back for you that may have been deleted, um, but that would have to happen fairly quickly, I guess, because it would be based on whatever their backups were. Um, and and I, I may be misspeaking on that and don't want to speak for Evernote on that point, um, but, um, you know, we've, we've had issues where um, there's been, you know, some issues with kids and questions about that, so, uh, and we haven't really lost anything so far. And somebody mentioned that once they had a picture in Evernote, how would they delete that that picture? You just simply delete the note, or you delete the picture and then empty it from your trash can. I mean, it functions very much like your desktop OS would, and, and the folder structure that you have on your computer. You know, when you when you have a, a picture or an, a, a document on your on your on your computer in your documents folder, and you delete it, it goes into your trash can, and then you have to empty your trash can. It's very much the same way. Great, thank you. And I'm looking for other questions I might have missed. If I did, please let me know. And again, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, not to not to plug, uh, you know, what I've got on my blog, but I do write about this extensively. There are a lot of other videos. There's video resources up there. There's a few other things up there, uh, and I'm always happy to answer uh, answer questions. Um, about all of this, um, and I'll type it in. I know people have been, but the blog is williamstites.net, um, and it, all all of these things are up there. And again, I'm I'm happy to to talk to people offline. I put a lot of stuff up on Twitter. Um, again, I have a I have a huge addiction to that. I somebody just put up, and I've saw this a couple times. Evernote versus Dropbox. Um, I think Dropbox is great. I use it extensively. Um, Dropbox, I think, is is different than this in that um, you, uh, you you're you're putting things in the Dropbox. You're not necessarily launching Dropbox to collect this information. You're using Dropbox to put a lot of stuff, but you're not using it as the tool for actually collecting it. Um, and that's one of the things that. Um, I think is is really important about this. You know, you can you can get Dropbox on all of these different things, but Dropbox isn't the tool for organizing. It's not the tool for creating all of these notes and putting all of these things in one place. It's where you then place all of these things and and work from them from that point. So I think, you know, um, I use Dropbox a lot when I'm when I'm um, you know collaborating with people and I need to put a lot of files up in different places. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you're going to find things that, oh, you could say, oh, well, I could use Evernote for that or I can use Dropbox for that, and I'm just going to use Dropbox, and that's fine. Um, you know, it, I think they, they both complement very well. They do similar things in, in, in some file storage sense, um, but from a, a note-taking and an application uh, interface perspective from multiple devices, um, I think that's where Evernote really shines. And is Evernote committed to having 
in keeping a free version? Yes, that is that is very important. Evernote is Evernote was uh, named Inc. Magazine's Company of the Year this year, and Evernote's story, if you read that article, is very interesting in that when Evernote was going for funding on all of this, um, they were often laughed at, you know, because of the fact that, you know, people would say, why, why would we pay for something that you're giving away for free? You know, you've got this what's called a freemium version that looks as good and is almost as good as, as what you would get if I pay, so why pay? And what they found is that, you know, the, 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 they base their um, business model off of, I think, a 3 or 5% conversion rate of people from free to premium, um, and and that's it. So it's a very low percentage of what they do, and I, I may be misquoting that, but it is it is ridiculously low in terms of what they're looking at. Um, and then they 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 really um, they really are basing how they're they're funding and doing everything off of that. So if Evernote has got you know 100 million users, you know. Two million of those may be paying for it. Three million of those may be paying for it, and that is what that's what they need to meet their. Money. So they have no, they have no um, the reason to take that off the table because that's what's getting people into it, and that that is a concern. You know, that's a that's a big concern I have as a director of technology when evaluating tools that come into our school that are quote unquote free. Well, how long are they going to be free? You know, how long until some company comes in and buys it off of them and, and, and takes it away? And that, that's not the model and the business model that Evernote has. And Steve has a question. When you're emailing something to your um, Evernote account, how do you select which notebook it's going to go to? That, that's great. Um, that is that is something that when you clip from a web page is very nice because you can select the notebook. What you have to do when you email it to them, again, they give you a unique email address. And then anywhere in the subject line, if you type at the at symbol and then your notebook name, it will go into that notebook. What I would love to see, and this is something that um, I need to find a good programmer or somebody to teach me programming, is um, I would love to see a plugin that I can put into my browser, my, not my browser, pardon me, my email client, that I can select, like I select a signature, I can select an Evernote notebook for that to go into. But, but, but without that idea or without that, that feature there, um, all you need to do, again, is in the subject line, put at and then the notebook name, and it will go directly into that notebook. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think about that with the email issue being a difficult way to select it. Right. There is nothing with a hashtag. The hashtag I see is people like asking a, about a hashtag. keyword. Right. The the Go at ahead. symbol is what you need to do with it. Is is a hashtag is 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 specific to Twitter mostly, the the pound sign or the, the hash symbol. Um, when you're when you're putting things into your Evernote notebook again, and and emailing them in, you use the at symbol. If I did say hashtag, I apologize. Again, it's my Twitter addiction coming through. But you put in the at and then the notebook name, and then it will go directly into that notebook. And I'm going to go ahead and officially close out the show, um, and then we will continue asking uh, questions of Bill. And we know that you have that you may have to go, but we hope that you'll be able to stay on, everyone. And we want to let you know that Steve Hargadon will be interviewing Lorette Lynn on February the 7th on Tuesday. And February the 9th, he'll be interviewing Alan Blankstein or Blankstein. And on February the 14th, Talad Smith. And February the 16th, he'll be talking with Jane, Jane Hart. And our upcoming sessions, we're going to have a great session with Steve Anderson talking about TPAC and Common Core Standards on February the 11th. 
I will be talking about QR codes in the classroom on February the 18th. And February the 25th, we'll be having a featured teacher session. And could you be the featured teacher session? We're looking for featured teachers, and we have a form that we would like you to fill out. It's separate from the survey. So the this is the tiny URL slash CR20Live. That's how all of our forms start. And then featured teacher, NOMINAT, N -O -M -I -N -A -T, again, tiny URL, CR20Live, featured teacher, N-O-M-I-N-A-T. And then you can nominate yourself as well as somebody else who is a classroom teacher, um, K-12 in the classroom, and let us know about some somebody who's doing some great work using technology in the classroom. What doesn't matter what grade level or experience level. Um, we just want to hear about some great featured teachers. And again, we're going to be uh, doing the, we want to remind you about the change, about doing the beginning session of using Blackboard Collaborate before the about 10 minutes before we start. Want to remind you about that. So we won't be doing that. We'll have an extra 10 minutes during our sessions to our guests uh, so that our guests will be able to uh, have a full hour to commit to their topic. And we are joining forces with the Live Binders group. And the next webinar is going to be February the 15th. And those are the times. And their session, their URL is tinyurl.com slash knowledge sharing place. And we hope that you will join them. They have great sessions talking about ways to use live binders and the content that they use. And they have great guests as well. And they're going to be using our room. And um, we hope that you will join for their uh, join them for their next session on Wednesday, the February the fifteenth. Oh, and I was a bit soon on the change about the collab uh, Blackboard Collaborate on how to participate in our Blackboard sessions. And when you exit today's session, a survey will automatically open in your browser. And if for some reason it doesn't, you can go to tinyurl.com slash CR20Live survey. As well as if you watch any of the recordings, you can also type in that, uh, that URL and request a professional development certificate. And if you can also email us at live at classroom20.com. And then we'll email you a certificate. Just put your name and email address. And give us a bit of time to get those out to you. And then you can uh, fill it in and print it out and, and submit those in to your uh, supervisor or personnel. We would also like to remind you about our iTunes U channel. And you can go directly and open up the channel directly in iTunes U by going to CR, tiny URL, CR20Live, iTunes U. You can subscribe to the MP4s or the MP3s or both, the video and audio collection, and take us with you wherever you go and review the sessions. Or if you miss a session, you can also do that. We also have on our archives and resources page of our website blog posts that you can subscribe to that way with the RSS feed if you didn't want to subscribe through iTunes U. We want to extend a very special thanks to Bill William today for sharing his information and to Steve Hargadon who is the founder of Classroom 20 Live and we're planning some great sessions, uh, some celebrations on our fifth, on Classroom 2.0's fifth year celebration. 
and to Weebly for providing our website and to each of you for sharing your information and ways that you use your uh, Evernote with your your colleagues and the way that you use it yourself. And we want to let you know um, that on Monday, February 13th, will be the ST Mini Geek Fest. Don't forget about that. Mark your calendars because that's going to be coming up shortly. That's also in Blackboard, and we want to thank Blackboard for providing our forum for the Geek Fest as well as for our session as well. This has been a great session on Evernote. And so now we're going to pass it back to Bill to take more questions and um, answer our questions. And if you have a way that you're using Evernote with your students or a way that you use it with your colleagues or yourself professionally that you would like to share, we invite you to take the mic. You can also just um, to continue to type your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, we will get the Live Binders link in the uh, chat as well in just a second as well. This has been a fantastic session today. Lots and lots of things here. I might have missed your question because they were going by quickly. So if I did, um, please retype them in the chat or click on the hand and we'll give you the mic and you can ask your question using the mic. We'll be happy to uh, give you the mic and you can ask Bill your question that way. So before we let Bill go, um, if I miss something, please uh, let us know. We don't want to let anybody go. Bill's contact information is also on the live binder in case you think of something after the session today, you can always contact him and ask him. That's his Twitter information. You can contact him on Twitter as well if you think of something after the session. Great. Justin, let me give you the mic. There you go. Justin, you have the mic. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Sure hey, Gus. All right, Bill, uh, thanks so much. Uh, awesome presentation. I loved the uh, presentation today. Um, one question I did have on um, Evernote, um, did you hear any rumors about uh, Evernote creating a um, web browser, kind of like Instapaper, uh, where you can clip um, articles on your iPhone? I'm not familiar with Instapaper, uh, but to, to clip them from your iPhone onto that, um, I am not. I haven't. I haven't heard anything. No. Um, the only thing I know that they do with the clipping is, is as I was talking about earlier, is the web clip from the uh, from the browser area. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Not a problem. Oh, I think I was thinking of Instagram. That makes the image, not Insta paper. Well, there, there was a article I saw uh, somewhere. I have to shoot it, um, to Peggy here on uh, Twitter, but there was a uh, uh, article somewhere where I read that Evernote is planning on creating something like that. The one, the one thing I will tell you with with Evernote, um, and I, I forgot to mention this when I was talking about all the different things that they that they've done over the, the years, is Evernote is really good about and this is good, you know, relative to what you think good is, but is really good about releasing different updates for different platforms, uh, independent of doing them across all platforms. So you may see certain things come out for the iPhone or for the Android or for the desktop that, you know, it's available on that device, um, but not on and or across all devices um, that, they, that they put out. They don't do these huge kind of like monolithic upgrades where, you know, it hits everything at once. So they do a lot of things based on what they can do and what they like based on the device um, and at the time that they've got it. The other thing that I will tell you is if you've got suggestions, if you've got ideas, you know, of things you'd like to see, email them. 
they are incredibly good about responding to requests. Now, this isn't going to say that you know you send something, they're going to do it, but if they get enough people um, asking for different things, they put time into doing it and and getting those things things done. So they're they're very open to suggestions and ideas, and because they don't do these huge monolithic upgrades. Um, they they have the ability to react to different needs for the different platform spaces that they occupy and really improve their products in those areas and then move them out across all of the different um, all the different platforms when they're able to. That's a great suggestion about contacting them. Thanks, Justin, for asking that question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sure thing. And does anybody else have a question that I might have missed or you'd like to ask? Okay, Jan, let me give you the mic. Okay, go ahead, Jan. Click on the top button, the talk button in the top left. Go ahead, Jan. Go ahead, Jan. I heard you for, I heard like, you a for like a second. And then, and then I didn't hear you. So hear you. you so might want to run out of the setup list. And then let me and know. And then let me know. Hey, Sarah, you have the mic? Hi, can you hear me okay? Sounds great, Sarah. Sounds great, Sarah. Okay. I just, I'm obsessed with this picture thing. I take a lot of pictures with the Evernote iPad app, and it puts it into the, my children's student portfolios, and they're huge, and it's really difficult to make any notes around them or anything. Is there any way for me to change that default of the size of that picture on the note? That's a good question. I'm not 100% sure on how to um, to, to uh, pull them out. I mean, I, I don't know of any way natively within the application to do it. Um, a lot of times what you would have to do is to pull them out and resize them. Um, whether you're on a, a Mac, you know, you can do that through Preview or through um, some other uh, applications and then put them back in at that point. We do have a lot of students that are taking pictures um, in in Evernote, uh, taking them out, putting them into Acrobat Pro or into Preview on the Mac, and annotating them in the science class and saving them and putting them back in. So I know we do a lot with you know taking pictures, putting them in and out, and 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 going for it on that that way. But again, not sure of a um, a way to natively do it within the iPad app itself. Yeah, Peggy, I think she was taking them right directly from within Evernote. Right, yeah. You can do you can do that. Um I just don't know a way to downsize them. Okay. Jen. Go ahead, Jen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh good. Um I just uh I've lost my my uh text my chat text window, so I, I can't put this link in there, but I just did a, a search, um, and there is a discussion on the Evernote uh, website in the forums about that, that feature request to, for building in an image cropper for um, mobile devices. Just wanted right, to right. let you know that. Great, great.
Okay, Jen, you should have the chat now. Do you see it now? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? I um where did it go? How did I how did I lose that? <laughs> you maybe moved it or closed it out by accident. Okay, thanks for putting it back. Sure. <laughs> Okay, Sarah. This is another session that um, might be very simple, but um, I how do, I've shared with parents, but how do I share with someone else who also has the Evernote app? Do I just send the email with the link as well, or is there a, a faster yep, that's way? It. Yep, that's it. Okay, thanks. I didn't get to hear that. Yeah, no, you you can uh all you need to do is send an email and when the people get the email they click on it uh and it allows you to share with that person at that point. It's it's fairly straightforward uh way of sharing. Great. And Bill, are you familiar with how to use Digo and over Evernote? Uh no, I have not done anything using a Digo with Evernote at that point. Okay. One thing you can do is you can share notes publicly. Um, you don't have to have an Evernote account in order to share notes. Um, the people can't edit those, but you can make your notes known to other people. Go ahead, sir. If I'm going to share with someone else who has Evernote, do I use their Evernote email address or do I use their regular email address? No, they're, 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 reg they're regular email address. Um, the Evernote, their Evernote email address, honestly, I, I tell people not to give that out um, because that sends notes directly into your notebook. So if somebody's got your Evernote email, if I'm sending a note, if I'm emailing something between colleagues about a project that we're working on and I want to store that in Evernote, I blind carbon myself on that, that note um, because otherwise on any reply or if that gets into their address book and they're starting to send me email at that address, it's just going into my Evernote notebook and I don't want to clobber my notebook that way. One more quick question then. Is it does the link that you send them sync itself like the Evernote note does as I edit it um in my my the, application? The the note when the when note, they get the sharing, they link, get the sharing link what they end up doing is they'll click, click on it and then it becomes available inside their Evernote notebook. So are the parents that doesn't have um, that doesn't have Evernote. If I share a file that is their child assessment portfolio with them, and I update that, do they when they go and access that um, link, is it updated in there as well? Yeah, they'll they'll see it. They won't be accessing it from Evernote. They'll be viewing it probably from a web browser at that point. Great, thanks, Sarah. And somebody asked about a a one to one program. And as far as fourth graders taking home the computers, those kind of just uh, that depends on how your program is structured and right. and and you know the the policies that go along with that, whether they take them home and and who buys them, whether the parents buy them or lease them. 
it depend it kind of depends on whether the school's buying the PTA or community. Bill, how is your program structured? Our, again, we are a independent day school, um, and uh, when we launched our one-to-one -one initiative, we again gave every student a uh, a 13 inch MacBook Pro. Um, they have in grades 4 through 12. They have those computers 24 7, 365 um, for as long as they are enrolled in the school. Um, they are admins on their own machines. We do have some management um, uh, policies set on them, um, but we wanted the, the, the faculty and the students to treat those machines as their own. So our students um, from, from fourth grade on have those computers. Um, our one-to-one our -one program actually goes down to the pre-K level where um, we have one-to-one -one, uh, opportunities in the classroom set up for them. They don't take anything home uh, in grades pre-K through three. But when they start in grades four, they get those computers. We've created a, um, a driver's manual and a driver's test. Um, for having the students uh, go through that information. Um, and with our fourth grades, they actually go through that with our, our middle school technology coordinators um, and, and their classroom teachers. Um, but everyone else goes through those materials on their own. Those materials are created and have been created for that driver's manual by both um, uh, faculty and staff in the tech department, but, but as, as well as um, through the work of our student laptop leadership group. Once the kids take that test and pass that test uh, and they get those administrative rights, the, the computer is theirs. So we, we're we very much modeling our one-to-one -one program uh, around this idea of ownership, of, of, of using the tool to not only teach with from a curriculum standpoint, but to teach with from a, a, a use standpoint. Um, you know, and to really use it as a complete learning experience, um, both in and out of the classroom. So it's it's somewhat um, unique, I think, if you're coming from a public school. Um, there are a number of other concerns that I think um, come into it when you're when you're dealing um, with public school and public school politics. Um, but that's how, again, we are doing things at at MKA. And it's the driver's license. The, the driver's test, the driver's license test, is that something that you're able to share or is that? If you go, if you go to driversmanual.mka.org, um, you can see a copy of that. I just want to confirm that, that address. Um, the driver's test, however, is um, part of our, uh, our Moodle site. Um, and is only available to uh, to people uh, that have access to Moodle. And again, that I'll put that address uh, in the in the chat window right now. That is our driver's manual. Um, again, everything that is here has been created by the tech department, our ed tech group people, as well as um, our student laptop leaders. So, um, you know, you feel free to feel free to browse and look around there if you. And if you have any questions, again. Um, you can get me on Twitter, uh, email me, um, however you'd like to get in touch with me. I'll be happy to answer questions about that as well. That's cool. You know those little ones are excited about getting there. You know, it's, it's amazing. The, 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 the fourth graders and our lower school kids, um, our lower division kids, I should say, um, are actually some of our best users. Um, they're anxious to get them. They want to treat them well. They want to do everything that they can to uh, to to show that they deserve, you know, they deserve to have them, and they're and they're great. I bet. I bet that would be a great age to work with. <laughs> it's fun. And are there any other questions for Bill before we let him go and enjoy the Saturday and Super Bowl weekend? That's Bill's um, email address. And it looks like the questions are winding down, but if you think of something afterwards, you can always email Bill at that address. And we thank you so much again, Bill, for joining it. us. And we will have... Next week, Stephen Anderson, Web 2.0 Classroom 
um, on, from Twitter. You might recognize that name. That will be another fantastic session next week about technology and curriculum content, matching activities and learn, uh, technology with learning activities. So that's going to be another great session next week as well. So if you're going to be in PCEA next week in Austin, I will be there too, so look for me. I'll be presenting, and uh, then I will see you uh, online and next Saturday for Stephen Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody. Enjoy the Super Bowl tomorrow in the United States. And take care, everybody. Have a great weekend. See you online.